So here we are, Season 2. I've decided that the incompetent storm droids is so normal at this point that I'm going to stop commenting on it until I see it as really, really bad. So if I see a particularly egregious example, I'll mention it. But otherwise, yeah, whatever. Quick aside, isn't this a little bit too early for there to be A-wings in the Rebel fleet? I don't know, I'm not actually sure of the timeline there, but considering this is four years prior, I don't know. Anywho, four years prior to A New Hope, by the way, which is before, yeah, you get it. So they actually got James Earl Jones for this, although they did the modulation with his voice to try and match up with A New Hope, which they did with Rogue One as well, and I didn't care for it in either case. It was still good to have James Earl Jones back, though. I wish we saw more Imperials like Makath Tua, the minister. I mean, don't mistake me. Obviously, I like good Imperials. I think it's a storytelling opportunity that they just don't follow as much as they frankly should. Too often, when you have a story in Star Wars about good Imperials, they turn rebel, and then they go and be part of the Rebel Alliance. But Makath Tua wasn't a good Imperial. She wasn't a bad Imperial, but she wasn't a good one either. She fit a nice little mold there. I'm reminded a little bit of how Palayan was in the early days, when he, they were first designing him, before he started being fleshed out into a full character. The idea of someone who isn't really evil, and doesn't want to do truly evil things, and in fact resists doing truly evil things. But they're not exactly good people either. They're interested in themselves and their own ideals or whatever. And they will only end up helping others as a consequence of it you know, coinciding with their self-interest. Still, it was an interesting character take, and I actually was pretty sad to see her die. I was hoping she would end up being part of the show regular. Alas, I suppose. I also find myself wondering why Agent Callus seems to be just kind of chill with all of this stuff going on. I mean, I know he's ISB and all that. But the show made a point of making, showing that he and her were both kind of disturbed by Tarkin summarily executing Imperial officers. Remember back in last season? So, I don't know. Let's see if they'll ever go, any, if they'll ever go anywhere with that. So, of course, there's a bit of a new dynamic going on, which actually is brought up and then never sent anywhere. I hope this is a character arc that's developed in the future. The idea that Kanan... Well, I'm just going to go ahead and quote quote word for word here because I wrote it down. I saw, I, you know, I survived one war. I don't want to survive another. And she's, and I, you know, I saw what it did. And she says to the Jedi, and his response is to everyone. It's a nice reminder of how devastating the Clone Wars really were. And well, as she points out, the Clone Wars ruined the Jedi. The mere fact that the Jedi ever went to war at all was always the trap. So it makes sense to me that Hera, who has always been the rebel, is the one who has to convince Kanan, the Jedi, who has always been the rogue, the smuggler, to try and be a part of this more organized military endeavor. Because he doesn't want to have anything, and, and have anything to do with that. I mean, would you? Now, <clears throat> this is the last time I'm going to comment on the ship thing, I swear. Because we're kind of done with that at this point. But there's this nice bit where they come in to Lothal, and there's three ISDs in orbit and two down on the planet. Ezra even comments on it. I've never seen so many destroyers here before. It's a nice little thing, and it still would have worked better if they'd done the ship escalation thing I mentioned. That's the last time I'll bring it up, I swear. We're done with it. We're good. Moving on. I mentioned here, you know, I was sad to see the minister die. The Lothal's gone. The minister's dead. You know, Vader has kind of entered into the, in the fray, and they're mentioning that they're going to go ahead and bring in a new Inquisitor. That makes sense, too, by the way. But before I get into that, I just mention this because it feels like this is effectively changing the status quo to establish a new one. They have officially left Lothal, which means the story, which through all of Season 1 has been very local, now by definition has to roam around a bit. I'm very curious to see how much it ends up moving in Season 2, or if we still stay, cont stay contained within, say, the same sector. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. We'll see where they go with it. I love how Vader's appearance inspires the exact amount of, you know, oh God, that it really should. They see Vader, and, uh, you know, compare and contrast the way they reacted to the Inquisitor when they first reacted to him. You remember that, right? It's like, oh, I'm going to take you down. <laughs> Charge, you know. And every time they saw the Inquisitor sense, there was no fear. He was just an opponent that they were mocking, just like any other Imperial. 
They don't charge Vader. They're terrified of him. And they should be. Vader effortlessly rolls over them. Absolutely just, yep, no, uh-huh, yep, all right. And he does it with style because he's Darth freaking Vader. But what I love most about it is the only reason that both Jedi do not die immediately is because Vader is not trying to kill them. This is one of the things that leads to kind of a problem when it comes to writing. This goes for anything, shows, movies, books, or games. If you're going to have a small scale encounter a large scale, you need to craft that encounter very carefully. Because what should happen, if this was just a straight one-on-one -on -one fight, what would happen was Vader would come in and effortlessly kill Ezra, distracting Kanan, to then effortlessly kill him, and then effortlessly kill the others. If that's what he wanted to do, then he would have succeeded within seconds. This is Darth Vader we're talking about. Again, I hate to keep emphasizing that point, but remember, as far as localized points of personal power, the only other thing in the galaxy right at this point in time that could really match up to him is Palpatine. And that's even debatable, because it's been 15 years, so, you know, maybe he can't match up to him anymore. So, yeah, no, that's... that's <laughs> they design it so that Vader is not actually there to kill them. And that makes sense. But this leads to the comment I kind of cut myself off on earlier. Vader is like, oh, you know, I have sensed that the, the apprentice of Anakin Skywalker is with them. Very well, says Darth Maul. I mean, Darth Sidious. <laughs> you must uh, send another Inquisitor. Now that makes sense, again, from a writing perspective. Because you can't just keep having Vader be here. There's only so many times that they can escape Vader before it starts losing all meaning or significance and starts just getting silly. Especially if this whole time Vader isn't actually trying to kill them. Or worse, if he does actually start trying to kill them. Now at some point or another, that's going to get old. So they need to once again downgrade the threat level. We've had our peak at the big fish. We've had Tarkin. We've had Vader. Now we need to get back down to things more at our scale. So he's going to send an Inquisitor after them and have that deal with it. Now you might say, well, why would they do that, especially with something as potentially high scale as Ahsoka? Well, it makes a degree of sense if you assume, assume that Vader has, to be perfectly blunt, more important things to do. The Empire is a large place, and, you know, the personal hand of Darth Vader is something that has always been used as a very precise, you know, deal with this, deal with this, deal with this kind of approach throughout the Empire. So it makes sense that he's basically just, i got to go deal with something else, so we'll send an Inquisitor in its place. We'll see where they go with that. We'll see where they go with that. I love Lando. <laughs> Again, by the way. Just just feel like pointing that out. Oh, oh, God, you're no gambler. If you're offering me two, it means you've got to have at least six. So I'll take three. It's just, it's just a nice thing. Once again, he is completely outmaneuvering everyone around him, but he's not really evil. He's just... Being himself, it's like, okay, I'll take three. What? No! <laughs> Love that. Anyways. Mm. I, I want to gush about Vader more. They do a really good job of showcasing him here. There's a nice scene where he deflects... Uh, Sabine shoots twice, and he just does two very precision deflections on that. One to hit her in the chest, and one to hit her in the head to knock her out. Just, bam, bam, done. Nope. Because he's Vader. He has that level of skill. I'm, you know, And I'm completely with it. And then he burns the village. Now, this is an interesting narrative point. He knows they're not there. He's doing this to hurt them, to get to them. Quick aside, they mention, oh, no, they're all prisoners of the Empire. Uh, how do they know that exactly? I, I'll tell you exactly how they know that. They know that because this is a kid's show, and they don't want to show an entire village of burnt skeletons on TV. Because that was my first thought. They even affirm it later. Oh, no, they've all been taken prisoner. How do you know that? Anyways, so Vader just goes after it, burns it to the ground, and he mentions that their mercy, their, their desire for helping others is a weakness that they can then exploit. Now, Lord knows Vader would have learned that lesson many times over. Remember, it's been 15 years since Revenge of the Sith, since Empire Day. So he's been having to deal with Palpatine and his <clears throat> Palpatineisms for a decade and a half. He can't really afford something like mercy. But I mention that because the village was burnt in order to hurt them. And then later on in this episode, they decide to return to Phoenix Squadron and rejoin the Rebel Alliance. 
And the reason they do that is because of a form of mercy. They want to do the right thing and help their fellows and unite, and that's what leads Vader directly to them. I don't know if that was deliberate or not, but it's a nice little undercurrent there that twice their desire to be good actually leads to harm as others are willing to exploit that. I love the fact that a single TIE advanced is able to just wreck the Rebel fleet. Now, granted, the Rebel fleet put up a pathetic showing. They sent out a few A-wings, and their corvettes did nothing. I'm sorry, corvettes do have anti-fighter guns on them. Come on, guys! But regardless, I don't think it would have changed anything. It would just be another thing Vader has to dodge. That is the best starfighter pilot in the galaxy. Aboard what at that point in time was probably the best starfighter in the galaxy. Although that can be argued, of course. But the TIE advanced is doom, and with Vader at the helm? No, I completely believe him. Just... If anything, they got away quite lucky with how few losses they took. The loss of one Corvette and most of a squadron? That's nothing. Now, that being said, <laughs> I gotta mention, why is it that Ezra is the first person to notice that it's Vader? Now, I point this out. One of the things I noticed in Season 1, and I hope this is on purpose, let me rewind a second. Back in the EU, there was an idea that wound its way through several different novels and works about each Jedi basically having their own specialization, the, a specific type of usage of the Force that they were best at. And it feels like Ezra's is detection, that he's, his scanner is better than others. And I kind of like that idea. And again, it's been pretty constant. I, I don't actually know if it's true or not, or if it's deliberate, I should say, or not. But it would make sense if that is true, why he would be the first one to detect Vader. The thing is, that's Ahsoka. Now, this gets into a weird t territory, and I'll talk about, about this more later, but... The way this is shown, it, remember this is part of the AU, where they're kind of restructuring some of how the Force works, and some of the specific underpinnings under the hood of how the Star Wars setting works. And I mention that because the exact distinction between Anakin Skywalker and Darth Vader is not a codified thing, really. It's something that's been debated many times by many people, and of course different writers had had different opinions on it. I bring this up because that would actually make a bit of sense if Ahsoka couldn't detect him you know, immediately like she probably should have been because she didn't know who Darth Vader was. She was gone by the time Revenge of the Sith happens. And she, the idea here being that the, the signature, if you will, of Anakin versus Vader is so different that she basically doesn't know what she's looking at. Thus, Ezra detects a Sith Lord he just encountered Ahsoka can't really tell what she's looking at. So that could kind of make a degree of sense if we assume the, you know, the variance between Anakin and Vader thing that I mentioned earlier. I do like the fact that Ahsoka is completely freaked out by the possibility. And Vader just says very calmly and simply, Huh, the apprentice lives. And that's all his reaction is. I also love how Ahsoka says, you know, do you know who he was? No, I don't. Huh. So we end the episode, we begin season two, a new status quo, and we'll see where it takes us going forward.